Arahato Sama Sambudasa Namata Sabagoato Arahato Namata Sabagoato Arahato Sama Sambudasa Sadu 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 Well, it is very um, appropriate to look at this subject and talk about it more in the open. And the subject is death and dying. Now, one of the things that's interesting about this is when I talk to people about it, most of you have already had this lesson, but I'm going to talk to you in reference to what happened to somebody tonight who was trained by the Buddha, in, uh, by, trained by, actually by Sariputta, and taught how to die. So this is a message to me that the Buddha had provided us with a way to escape suffering and use the antidote that he had found when he discovered, uh, brought up the Four Noble Truths and uh, he started to frame his teaching for he was going to teach the same thing for 45 years. And it's fascinating to me, sometimes when I say that, I still go aghast, you know, because 45 years of teaching, and yet we don't systematically expect our monks and teachers to be teaching us from what he said. And that's where Bhante is different, Bhante Bimala Ramsey. And it was a very good thing, I think, because as an old Christian, I was a Christian for 50 years. I went, worked with several different churches in that time in the music in the different churches primarily, but I was in Episcopalian and Lutheran and I was a Mormon for seven years and they have a lot of music. So I really, I really liked working with the choirs. I had to build five choirs for this big church that had 600 families. It was really fun. One for the women, one for the men, one for the women and the men, <laughs> one for the young women and one for the young men. <laughs> it was really fun. Anyway, I did that for a number of years and taught Sunday school there. Yeah. So some people have a view in life. They, they somehow understand easily that life is starting when you're born and you go through a lifeline, you live on a lifeline, and then you die. And they don't look at this, maybe they live in the country on a farm, and they grow their crops, and they know there's a beginning, a middle, and an end, and they know there's a right way and a wrong way of growing the crops, and the very simile of this gets into their lives, and the animals are being born, and some are, are slaughtered and others and are used in various ways. And um, so all of this being born, living and dying is familiar to the farmer and to the people who live in the country are very in touch with this. But when we go into the cities, really all over the world, it's true. A lot of children I met in cities that I lived in over the years, they didn't know any in touch with this at all, even in the sense of a kitten's being born and one dying or being born and nine lives of a cat. They never heard the story of the nine lives of the tricky cat who keeps almost dying and living again and almost dying and living again. It's really fun. And you're wondering how many lives has my cat had yet? You know. I had one that went through six times we thought he was dead. And when he was a kitten, he was, oh, he was bitten by a, a rattlesnake and he actually survived. And um, that was quite amazing. That was his start. And the next week he got uh, hit by a tractor a tire. And so after that, he definitely his name was Trouble. <laughs> Trouble was his name. <laughs> And I understand he's still around, and now there are a whole lot of little troubles running around <laughs> because he's still there, and another cat came, and they were breeding gray and white cats. So we say the trouble family is living there now. But anyway, um, if you're in touch with life, 
and you understand life is this birth and living the lifeline and there's always going to be a death so the one thing we're always looking for what do all the people on the earth have in common they are going to be born they're going to live and they're going to die and they all have blood they donate you can't pick who put the blood in and the blood is there if you have an accident you get the blood everybody's all mixed up and they don't even know it <laughs> you know and so it's i don't see the problem with people i really don't and we should be way past this at this point thinking about this person or that person anyway i don't want to go there right now uh, okay so anyway um this lifeline is important to be in touch with because the people who understand and are close to it those people Death is part of life, but the other people, death is forbidden to look at, and the person becomes afraid of death. And there's nothing to be afraid of in death. And I'm saying this, but I worked in a lot of hospitals over the years too. And, and one time when I was traveling with Fanti, and we were involved in training a bunch of nurses in Florida, and um, I started asking the RNs questions and later I asked the doctors the same question, but the answer was always the same. And so what was the question? If the hospital has all of the departments in one building, you know, not like different buildings, the way they build the new ones, but if you have the hospital and it has all the departments in the same big building, where is most of the suffering, the loud suffering? Which department has the loudest suffering? Really, sorrow, lamentation, pulling your clothes, just terrible, terrible pain and sorrow and everything. Where is it the worst in the hospital? Let's see what they answer. I was thinking the emergency room, it has to be the emergency room because I'd been there and accidents come and go, but they said, yeah, but that's not where it comes and stays for a while. <laughs> no, that's not it, okay. Well, then I said, uh, you know, maybe, I don't know where. <laughs> and then they said, how about the people dying? And they went, no, it's not the people dying. It's not the people who are terminal or about to die. Well, where could it be? And the, the answer was super logical. It's obstetrics, <laughs> obstetrics where the women are having the babies. Now, now I'll tell you, I had some babies. <laughs> and the first one uh, was real interesting. Uh, but the second one was even more interesting uh, because when I was in labor with that one in the hospital, when I was in labor with my son, they rolled in a woman who was next to me in a bed and she didn't know anything about having this baby she was about to give birth to and the moment she had a contraction she screamed louder than a wolf or some animal that was being killed i mean she just and the whole time she was going through her labor and i told the nurse very calmly I spent months, I mean months, learning Lamaze, and I was really in control of this really big baby I was going to give birth to. And I said, if you don't move her out of this room or give her a sedative, if she does this a couple times more, I might just get up and kill her. <laughs> I just couldn't believe her. She just lay there and she just screamed and her husband didn't come and help her and the nurses were just upset because she didn't want this and she didn't want that, but she didn't have any training to have this natural birth, you see. Oh my goodness. But that's what those nurses told me. That's where all the noise was. So I said to them, you know, what about people dying? And one nurse piped up and she said, it's not hard to die. And I said, what do you mean it's not hard to die? And she said, are you ready? And I said, what? And she said, take a breath. Go ahead, take a breath. 
and let your breath out. That's it. You died. That's all it is. And so, but I said, what about the people who struggle? The people who struggle usually want to have drugs. They don't want to know what's happening, she said. But what about dying? And what about what Buddha told us about the last thought in your mind about dying? And that go, help having something to do with where you're going to be born again, if you are born again. Well, what about this? And I started talking to Bonte and he started giving me books. <laughs> and he gave me lots of things to read on this. But the, the, I gave you one, there are, in the stuff I gave you today, there are three things in there. And we're gonna look at three things. We're gonna, first of all, we're going to look at the second one, which should have been the first one. <laughs> we're gonna look at that one. So Bonte, you wanna put this up and I'll explain it. Um, there are three suttas we are going to look at. And the first one is about a man who almost died. And I think you'll see what happens by what's in it. And then second one we're going to look at is Anathapendika's death. Because it's very, very important. When I came to Sri Lanka and I found out about that sutta. I, I didn't think much of it at first, but then I started to think more about did, how people were asking me, did he, what did he tell you with the Dhamma? And they kept asking me. And I think it's one of the most profound things to see how the teaching was given to Anathapinika as he was dying. Because this has got to be the ultimate example of Donna, and that's what hit me tonight when I was talking to people earlier today. This is what hit me about tonight. I, <laughs> I was trying to find suits and people kept calling me today and they called about the same thing every time. So here I was and I thought, what are you ignoring this for? This is obviously what you need to use tonight. You see, what they were talking about is what can I do when my family member is dying? And what can I do for the other members of the family when he's dying or she is dying. And what should we be doing and what should we not be doing when the person is dying? And this is all here, it's all in the text. We don't have to reinvent it. Look at the Nakalaputta Sutta first. Bhante, if you wanna put that up, or I, how do I do I just go to share screen, yeah? Okay, and I, oh, I have to go to the, let's see, this is gonna be tricky. I have to go and open it up. Is that right? Correct. Open okay. it. Let me... Okay. Oh, go. I have to get to it. Wait a second. Wait a minute. I should, it should go back here. Hold on. Hmm. That's the last one I worked on. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Why don't you want to come up? You don't want to come up? Come on. Hmm. Oh, wait a second. I'm sorry. I know what I did wrong. Okay. Okay, let me see. I'm getting there. I didn't think I had to do it this way. Okay. Now I come back to you, right? I come back. Okay. Um, A green button, minute. share screen. Yes. Oh, wait a minute. Okay, I got it. Now I see it. Okay. 
Now, <clears throat> now you guys, you guys were given this, and I know it's kind of long, but I wanted you to have it, and so I went to a, a lot of trouble today to reformat it, so you would be able to do what I did with it. So what we're going to talk about pretty openly is about um, the ultimate action of generosity uh, that is inside the text. And there's a couple examples in, in the in the thing with uh, uh, De Silva, what she collected in that reference package about this, you will find it was already posted on WhatsApp. And you will find a story about the monk, the two monks that were sick that the Buddha took care of and how that established how the monks were supposed to take care of each other. And he gave a talk about uh, because you don't have, he told them because you don't have your parents and relations with you anymore, you have to treat each other like this. And he showed them how to do take care of those monks until one was better and the other one died, the one with the boils. And um, it's a very famous story and very important because it establishes for the monks, they cannot ignore each other because nobody else is going to take care of them. They have to take care of each other. So they can't walk around just ignoring them and thinking it's a singular adventure and just ignore each other. And this gets to be a problem when you look at how things are set up today, especially in India, where there are not a lot of five or six monks living together in these temples, and what are they gonna do, how organized their organization is, because structurally they do not have a good disciplinary system in, in India. So how, I don't know how they handle it. I can only say that, I can't. I know it's not good, but I'm not gonna say it's really bad either. But I know it's not good because I've seen some situations where nobody cares about, and that's sad because they're forgetting these key stories and why it was they were supposed to be taking care of each other. It's very important. What he did when he took care of those monks is called servant leadership. Servant leadership is when there's a leader in a group of people, leader in Sunday school, leader in any, any group doing anything, and the leader actually does what he expects the people to do. He doesn't just talk about, you need to do this, you need to do that, do it this way, do it that way. He does it, and they see him and the benefit of it, and then they're asked to do it, and they do it. So we start with these. We're gonna review one of them. So I'm gonna roll down here first through this one. The one, when we do the one on Anathapindica, I want you to see how I, when I go through it, you'll be able to follow it as we do it because I laid it out perfectly. So when you print it off, you shouldn't have to change much of it to be able to use it the way I'm going to show you how you can use it. Okay, let's see. We go into the second one. And this one is called the, Nakalapitu Sutta. Um, and the discourse to Nakala's father. This situation, I think you'll get it when I read it, but basically his father almost died, but he didn't die. And that's what led to this sutta. Okay. Thus I have heard on one occasion the Blessed One was staying in the Deer Park in the Visaka forest in the Baga country. And then the householder, Nakalapitu, he went to the Blessed One and saluted him and sat down on one side. The wish, let not the mind be sick. Sitting thus at one side, the householder, Nakalapitu, he said this to the Blessed One, I am now old, Bhante, aged, elderly. My time has gone. I have reached the term of life, sick in the body. I'm always ill. Rarely, Bhante, do I get to see the venerable blessed one and the monks who are worthy of esteem. And please advise me, venerable blessed one, Teach me, Venerable Blessed One, for my own good and happiness for a long time. 
So it is, householder. So it is, householder. Sick in this body, householder. You are burdened. You are hampered by suffering. Householder, anyone caring for this body who claims even a moment's health would be nothing but foolishness. And therefore, householder, you should train thus yourself. My, my body may be sick, but my mind will not be sick. And this is what he told him to keep repeating. My body may be sick, but my mind will not be sick. Thus, you should train yourself, householder. And then a householder, Nakulapito, joyfully approved of the Blessed One's word. And standing up, he saluted the Blessed One, keeping him to the right. And then he approached the Venerable Sariputta. Having approached the Venerable Sariputta, he saluted him, and he sat down at his one side. Nakula Pitu meets Sariputta. As the householder Nakula Pitu was sitting there at one side, the Venerable Sariputta said this to him, clear are your senses, householder. Pure is your countenance. You must have received a Dharma talk in the presence of the Blessed One today, have you not? How could it be otherwise, Bhante? Only just now I was anointed with the ambrosia of the Blessed One's Dharma talk. And with what kind of ambrosia of a Dharma talk did the Blessed One anoint you, householder? Here, Bhante, I went up to the Blessed One, and then Nakalupitu related all that happened, and the Blessed One said this to me, therefore you should train thus yourself. My body may be sick, but my mind will not be sick, and thus you should train yourself, householder. And that was how, Bhante, I was anointed with the ambrosia of the Blessed One's Dharma talk. But householder, Sariputta asks, did it not occur to you further? You should ask the Blessed One in return. Hello, Sister Gemma. Okay, I got it. Okay? Yeah. We're okay. okay, let's continue. But householder, Sariputta asked, did it occur to you further as the Blessed One in return as regards how one is sick in body and also sick in mind, how one is sick in body but not sick in mind? 
Bhante, we would even come from afar to the Venerable Sariputta's presence to know the meaning of this statement. It would be good if the Venerable Sariputta would clarify the meaning of this statement. Now we look at two situations, two different people. The untaught mind, in that case, householder, listen and pay close attention to it. I will speak. Yes, Bhante, the householder Nakulapitu answered to the Venerable Sariputta. The Venerable Sariputta said this, how householder is the body sick and the mind sick too? Here, householder, an untutored ordinary person who sees not the noble ones, unskilled in the way of the noble ones, and untrained in the way of the noble ones, who sees not the true individuals and is unskilled in the way of the true individual, untrained in the way of the true individual, and regards form as self, or self as possessing form, or form as in self, or self as in form. He lives obsessed by the notions, I am this form, form is mine. As he lives obsessed by these notions, from that form changes, and uh, as that cha form changes, and alters. With the change and alteration of the form, there arises in him a sorrow, lamentation, physical pain, mental grief, and despair. He regards feeling as self, and self as possessing feeling, or feeling as in the self, or self as in the feeling. And he lives obsessed by these notions. I am the feeling, feeling is mine. And as he lives obsessed by these notions, that feeling changes and alters. And with the change and alteration of feeling, there arise in him sorrow, lamentation, physical pain, mental grief, and despair. He regards perception as self, or self as possessing perception, perception, or perception in his self, or self as in the perception. He lives obsessed by the notions, I am perception, perception is mine. And as he lives obsessed with these notions, that perception changes and alters. And with the change and alteration of perception, there arises in him sorrow, lamentation, pain, grief, and despair. And he regards the formations as self and self as possessing formations or formations as in the self or self in the formations. He lives obsessed by the notions, I am formations, formations are mine. And as he lives obsessed by these notions, those formations will change and alter. And with the change and alteration of formations, there arises in him sorrow, lamentation, pain, grief, and despair. So he's really talking about a Nietzsche and how when these formations may change, he does not change. And he is upset, full of grief, because he's struggling with this belief of I am that. He regards consciousness as self, even his consciousness, and self as possessing consciousness, or consciousness as in the self, or self as in the consciousness. And he lives obsessed by the notions, I am consciousness, consciousness is mine. As he lives obsessed in this way with these notions, that consciousness changes and alters. And with the change and alteration of consciousness, there arise in him sorrow, lamentation, pain, grief, and despair. And thus, householder, is the body sick and the mind is sick too. Do you understand this? If you believe in that everything is me, it is mine and myself, 
This is going directly in line with the Chichaka Sutta that we know, number 148. And the lesson was the monks were saying, how did this happen? How did we come to think of this this way? And the Buddha gave the lesson because wow. when something rises, I believe I am that. It is me, it is mine, it is myself. But he, and then he, they say to him, but how, how do we get out of this selfish situation? Believing everything is me, it is mine, is myself. Therefore, it would be, it would mean I am to blame and it is my fault and I am what is and it isn't so. And then he asked them in Chichaka Sutta, and Chichaka Sutta, the next section says, but the, that is how it happened. You grew up believing this way. And then the next section says, right, after that, how do we get out of this? And he says, you practice. I am not this. This is not me. It is not mine. It is not myself. And you see this in Satipatthana. Same thing. Main, main point of body feeling, mine and Dhamma's, was this idea of getting this understanding. It is not me, it is not mine, it is not myself. It is as it is, which will arise, will be there, will pass away. That's what? That's Anicca. That's why we meet Anicca so many times when we're talking about suffering. We didn't want it to change or we wanted it to change, but we had to make, try to make it change. We didn't want it here, so we get obsessed with trying to make it stop. You see? We're not accepting the present moment as it is and laughing because we know a Nietzsche is real and it will pass. And so the Westerner will say, this too shall pass away. Now we look at the well-taught mind. How householder is the body sick? but the mind not sick. Here, householder, the learned noble disciple who sees the noble one, skilled in the way of the noble ones and trains in the way of the noble ones. He sees the true individuals and is skilled in the way of the true individual, trained in the way of the true individual. He does not regard form as self, nor self as possessing form nor form as in the self, nor self as in the form. He does not live obsessed by these notions, I am form, form is mine. And as he lives not possessed by these notions that form changes and alters with the change and the alteration of form, there do not arise in him sorrow, lamentation, pain, grief, and despair. Why? Why not? Because he knows the form is not me. It is not mine. It is not myself. When we listen uh, to the sections in the Chachaka, for those who are working on memorizing Chachaka, you always hear this repetition of in, in the one section where um, dependent on an I and form, I consciousness arises, the meaning of the, uh, the three is eye contact with eye contact as condition. Eye craving, eye, eye feeling comes up with eye feeling as condition, eye craving comes up, you know? And then you hear them talk about when this changes, I do not change. When this is gone, I am not gone. So how could it be? And the Buddha saying to them, how can it be? Look closely. How can it be when that form leaves, you have not left? How can it be the sound hits the ear and happens, but it is not me, it is not mine, it's not myself. It cannot be because the sound arises, is there, passes away. But I am still here. This is his argument. So he uses this logic. You see, this is his part of his box. And we'll talk about the toolbox a little bit later. He does not regard feeling as self, nor self as possessing feeling, nor feeling in self, nor self in feeling. He lives not obsessed by the notions, I am feeling, feeling is mine. And as he lives not obsessed by these notions, the feeling changes and alters 
but with the change and alteration of the feeling, there does not arise in him any sorrow, lamentation, pain, grief, or despair. And he does this again with the perception and notions. And he does not regard formations as self or self as possessing formations. Formations as in self nor self in formations. He lives not obsessed by the notions, I am the formations. The formations are mine. These are the thoughts, okay? The forms were the I and form. The formations are thoughts. Thoughts are mine. And as he lives, not obsessed by these notions that those thoughts change and alter, and the change and the alteration in the formations, with those happening, there do not arise in him sorrow, lamentation, pain, grief, and despair. Once again, why? Because he understands Anicca. And then he talks about consciousness, he even goes to that level of consciousness. It is not me. It is not mine. It is not myself. I will watch it arise. I will witness it and understand it will always pass away. And this is what the Venerable just said in the Householder Nekulakuta. He was, um, I cannot say that, <laughs> Nekulapitu was delighted and approved of the Venerable Nariputa's work. So this was this lesson about the body can be sick but the mind doesn't have to be sick, you see? And this is one of the big things about cancer because the cancer is come in your body and metastasized through your body, your bones, your blood and this, but your brain is here and your brain does not have to be sick. Sometimes we have a tumor in the brain. That's a different story. But in most cases, when we're talking the blood cancers, the bone cancers, uh, carcinoma, the melanomas, and the um, different types of cancers. We're not talking about it has to be in the brain. We're talking about something that can happen or an accident that can happen, but the brain is fully conscious. And that's where we can have a lot of relief from what's happening in pain in the body because our brain is still operating. So this is the first part of this, which I wish I had made number one. And this is about, this is not, this is not mine, this is not mine. But now what I want you to see is what happened with Anathapindika. And who was Anathapindika? This is another thing that I was gonna, uh, going to talk to you about. He was an amazing person and anybody who has this book this one okay this is the book okay anybody who has this book this is the buddha and his teachings if you go into page amongst his lay followers he was regarded as the foremost alms giver Original name of Anathapindika, which means the feeder of the helpless, was Sudatta. Owing to his unparalleled generosity, he later was known by his new name, Anathapindika, and his birthplace was in Sawati. And he helped the monks and he encouraged the monks. And one of the things we say about um, the Anathapindika is, he was the manager of the roadies. Now, what, what are roadies? I have to explain this to you. In America, they have great big music concerts and music festivals. And when they have these festivals, it doesn't matter if it's rock and roll or if it's anything, anything at all. It's always the same way. There is a set of roadies. They're the people that go ahead of the people who are the performers and the orchestra. And those people go ahead and they clean the stage and set it up. And they're the ones that put all of the lines down, the equipment, so everyone's safe. They prepare the food for everyone involved. They make sure everybody has rooms. These are the people that do the logistics on distance concerts and stuff. And there's a manager in charge of that who is constantly busy and rarely, even during a concert, will get to actually listen to a concert. 
And so this is a Nathapindika's situation in life was he was the roadie manager that moved around and followed the Buddha around ahead of everybody, usually ahead of 500 to 1200 monks. And you think about the logistical planning it takes to make sure they have a place to sleep and rest and water and everything they need and the food is coordinated with whoever is donating it and everybody has enough of everything. And then during the time people are listening to the Buddha talk, there's always things that are happening where he's not able to probably listen to the whole thing without people coming and saying, but this is wrong, we have to fix this, but this is wrong, we have to fix that. That went on even in that time, I guarantee. Because when we look at his life, He's constantly, in the stories about him, he's, we're wondering why he's asking certain questions in some of the suttas. The reason is because he couldn't listen closely and do his job at the same time. This is what I have deduced from this, knowing roadies and knowing what it takes with these concerts, okay? So we do this one, is called Advice to Anathapindika. And it is Majima Nikai number 143. And this is different because this one is going to give you a sample solution of what you can teach a person. And this is something I have used. I will tell you about it when we're finished. And it helps people. And they can learn to do it easily, even if they're not Buddhists, they can learn to do this. And if they take this as an, something that occupies their time if they're caught in the hospital before they die especially. They can listen to it on a recording, they can memorize it and recite it with them before they go to sleep. And at that time, when it's time to leave, if they're doing this, this can totally relieve them and have them leave with a very, very clear mind. And that's the most important thing we're taught in Buddhism about leaving that lifeline at the end. Okay. Thus I have heard on one occasion, the Blessed One was living at Sawati in Jetta's Grove and at the Pindaka's Park. Now on that occasion, the householder and not the Pindaka was afflicted suffering and gravely ill. And then he addressed a certain man thus, good man, go to the blessed one, pay homage in my name with your head at his feet. We're getting an unstable sign here. And say, venerable sir, the householder Anathapindika is afflicted, suffering and gravely ill. He pays homage with his head at the Blessed One's feet. And then I want you to go to Venerable Sariputta, pay homage in my name with your, your head at his feet and say to him, Venerable Sir, the householder Anathapindika is afflicted. He is suffering and gravely ill. He pays homage with his head at the Venerable Sariputta's feet. Then say, it would be good, venerable sir, if the venerable Sariputta would come to the residence of the householder Anathapindika, out of compassion. Yes, sir, the man replied, I will do this. And he's saying, he went to the blessed one and after paying homage to the blessed one, he sat down on one side, delivered his message, and then went to Venerable Sariputra, did as he was bid, and said, delivered the message. It would be good if you would come to the residence of Householder Anathapindika out of compassion. And the Venerable Sariputra, he consented in silence. He nodded his head. Then the Venerable Sariputta dressed and taking his bowl and outer robe, he went to the residence of the householder Anathapindika. And the Venerable Ananda as his attendant. Having gone there, he sat down on a seat, made ready, and said to the householder Anathapindika, 
I hope you are getting well, householder. I hope you are comfortable. I hope that your painful feelings are subsiding and not increasing and that they're subsiding and not increase is apparent. Venerable Sariputta, I am not getting well. I am not comfortable. My painful feelings are increasing, not subsiding. Their increase and not their subsiding is apparent. It is just as if a strong man were splitting my head open with a sharp sword, so too the violent winds are cutting through my head. I am not getting well. It is just as if the strong man were tightening a tough leather strap around my head as a headband, and so too there are violent pains in my head. I'm not getting well. It is just as if the skilled butcher or his apprentice were to carve up an ox's belly with a sharp butcher's knife, so too the violent winds are carving up my belly. I am not getting well. It is just as if two strong men were to seize a weaker man by both arms and roast him over a pit of hot coals. It is so too, there is a violent burning in my body. I'm not getting well. I am not comfortable. My painful feelings are increasing, not subsiding, and their increase and not their subsiding is apparent. At this point, we know he's in bad shape and he's really seriously, he's dying and Sariputta knows it and so does Ananda. And then Sariputta starts to train him as the monks would train each other. And the how he said to him, householder, you should train thus. I will not cling to the eye and my consciousness will not be dependent on the eye. Thus you should train. I will not cling to the ear and my consciousness will not be dependent on the ear. I will not cling to the nose and my consciousness will not be dependent on the nose. I will not cling to the tongue and my consciousness will not be dependent on the tongue. I will not cling to the body and my consciousness will not be dependent on the body. I will not cling to the mind and my consciousness will not be dependent on the mind. Thus you should train. So right away we see something that's happening here where he's teaching him to do what? He's teaching him to let go. He's teaching the diminishment, the moving away from the act of life, the letting go, the leaving, the relinquishment of holding on. Householder, you should train thus. I will not cling to forms and my consciousness will not be dependent on forms. I will not cling to sounds and my consciousness will not be dependent on sound. I will not cling to odors and my consciousness will not be dependent on odor. I will not cling to flavors and my consciousness will not be dependent on flavor. I will not cling to tangibles and my consciousness will not be dependent on tangibles. I will not cling to arising thoughts and my consciousness will not depend on arising thoughts. Thus you should train. Householder, you should train thus. I will not cling to I consciousness and my consciousness will not be dependent, not depend on I consciousness. I will not cling to ear consciousness and my consciousness will not depend on ear consciousness. I will not cling to nose consciousness and my consciousness will not depend on nose consciousness. I will not cling to tongue consciousness and my consciousness will not depend on tongue consciousness. I will not cling to body consciousness and my consciousness will not depend on body consciousness. 
I will not cling to mind consciousness and my consciousness will not depend on mind consciousness. Thus you should train. I will not cling to eye contact and my consciousness will not depend on eye contact. I will not cling to ear contact. My consciousness will not depend on ear contact. I will not cling to nose contact and my consciousness will not depend on nose contact. I will not cling to tongue contact. My consciousness will not depend on tongue contact. I will not cling to body contact and my consciousness will not depend on body contact. I will not cling to mind contact and my consciousness will not depend on mind contact. Thus, you should train. Step by step, the, adminish, the, admi, the diminishment, the relinquishment, the giving up is happening. Now, this is interesting. We stop a second because you see the problem is the clinging, the craving and the clinging is what is causing the suffering. Remember last week we said you cannot crave and cling unless there's a pronoun. So I is part of what is being let go. What I want, I want, and the grasping and the holding, the clinging and holding on. This is without understanding. This is actually part of life, to leave life. Struggling against a wave that's coming in from the ocean, it can't be done. Instead of riding the wave, he's trying to push the wave, and this is what he's asking him to let go. The interesting part about this is for the person in the hospital who has the serious pain in the bone for sarcoma cancer or the total fear that just think about fear all day with the person who has the blood disease of Hodgkin's disease or um, the lymphomas. The fear is I can't hang on, but the body is trying to heal. And if we're putting replacement platelets in and some of the diseases to help you keep going, the question is, we're struggling to help you stay longer and longer and longer. It's for you to decide if things are in order and it's time to let go and just reach this end. But I need to stay for them is one of the big thoughts. What about you? You're going to fall apart. What about the family members? This is another part of this we'll talk about. Next part. You should train thus. I will not cling to feeling born of eye contact and my consciousness will not depend on feeling born of eye consciousness. I will not cling to feeling born of ear contact and my consciousness will not depend on feeling that is born of ear consciousness. I will not cling to feeling born of nose contact and my consciousness will not depend on feeling born of nose consciousness. I will not cling to feeling born of tongue contact and my consciousness will not depend on feeling born of tongue contact. I will not cling to a feeling born of body contact and my consciousness will not depend on feeling born of body consciousness. And I will not cling to feeling born of mind contact and my consciousness will not depend on feeling born of mind consciousness. Thus, you should train. Householder, you should train thus. Now, this is interesting because now he takes him away from his senses into the broader part of the parts of the body, the, the, not the six senses, but into the parts of the body. And relate, remember that the Buddha always teaches the elements how. He teaches it as the body. So he teaches the earth element, the water element, fire element, air element, and then he teaches the space element also and the consciousness element. So in the beginning of his teaching, we can go back and find he was teaching the traditional Chinese four elements, 
But then he starts to relate the whole thing to the body structure, and he goes and teaches the space and consciousness elements. In the later suttas, we find him teaching six, six uh, elements instead of four. I will not cling to the earth element, and my consciousness will not depend on the earth element. I will not cling to the water element, and my consciousness will not depend on the water element. I will not cling to the fire element, and my consciousness will not depend on the fire element. I will not cling to the air element, and my consciousness will not depend on the air element. I will not cling to the space element, and my consciousness will not depend on the space element. I will not cling to the consciousness element and my consciousness will not depend on the consciousness element. Now, this part, if you don't realize it, when we go into Satipatthana and we're looking at studying these, our, the body, we're looking at these elements when we are talking about the teaching of the body. So when you're ill and you're looking at this that way, you go back here and you review. In the earth element, we say we look at the, the body from the top of my head to the soles of my feet. Bounded in skin and full of many kinds of impurities. In this body, this is the earth element. There are head hairs, body hairs, nails, teeth, skin, flesh, sinews, bones, bone marrow, kidneys, heart, liver, diaphragm, spleen, lungs, intestines, the mysentery, contents of the stomach, the feces, bile, phlegm, pus, blood, sweat, fat, tears, grease, spittle, snot, oil of the joints, and urine. This is the content, this is the structure of the body he's teaching. In this way, he explain, He looks at this, and then he looks at each element as the water in relation to all the liquid in your body. And then he looks at the fire as the heat of digestion and the fever of the body, which is happening to him as he's dying. And that's what he's looking at, the fever element. And then the air element, which is flowing through your body as a system of breathing through, and the space element that is in between the organs in the body. When you see an autopsy, you see there's organs in there, but you see space in between them. This is the space he's talking about and the consciousness element my consciousness will not depend on consciousness element. Thus you should train. Now he takes him away to the five uh, aggregates. He's going back, see, falling away. I will not cling to material form and my, my consciousness will not depend on material form. I will not cling to feeling and my consciousness will not depend on feeling. I will not cling to perception and my consciousness will not depend on perception. I will not cling to formations and my consciousness will not cling to the formations. That's thoughts in this case. And I will not cling to consciousness and my consciousness will not be uh, dependent on consciousness. Now he talks about the mental states. I will not cling to such a state as the base of infinite space, and my consciousness will not depend on the base of infinite space. I will not cling to such a state as the base of infinite consciousness, and my consciousness will not depend on the base of infinite consciousness. I will not cling to such a state as the base of nothingness, and my consciousness will not depend on the base of nothingness. I will not cling to such a state as the base of neither perception nor non-perception, and my consciousness will not be dependent on the base of neither perception nor non-perception. Thus, you should train. Now, there's for meditators, there's always the danger when you're dying, you want to get fixated on one of these infinite space, infinite consciousness or nothingness, and you really liked it there. 
and you manage to sit three, four, five hours in nothingness, you know, and there's just this nothing there. And it's amazing, but also infinite consciousness is good and infinite space is wonderful. But do we want to hold on to that when we're leaving? And so this is why it's in the sutta. He doesn't want him to get attached to that. Householder, you should train thus. I will cling, not cling to this world and my consciousness will not be dependent on this world. I will not cling to the world beyond and my consciousness will not be dependent on the world beyond. And thus you should train. Householder, you should train thus. I will not cling to what is seen, heard, sensed, cognized, encountered, sought after, and examined by the mind, and my consciousness will not be dependent on that. So he's not going to go off with his mind investigating stuff. He's going to let it all diminish peacefully and watch what happens inside. It's another phenomena to discover. And when this was said, the householder and not the Pandika wept and he shed tears. And then the venerable Ananda asked him, are you foundering householder? Are you sinking? I am not foundering venerable Ananda. I am not sinking. But although I have long waited upon the teacher and the monks worthy of esteem, Never before have I heard such a talk on the Dhamma. You see, he was always so busy, busy with everybody, making sure everybody had what they needed. That's what he said. You see, although I've waited on the teacher and the vicars and taken care of everybody and everything, every time you move around the country, worthy of esteem, and I help you and make sure everything's going right. Never before have I heard such a talk on the Dhamma. And yet he was there. He was there at all those talks. Well then, he says, such talk on the Dhamma householder is not given to the lay people clothed in white. Now this part, Bhante Vimala Ramsey claims really came out of the Vasudhi Maga, and I haven't had time to really verify the, the root of this, but um, such talk on the Dhamma is given to those who have gone forth. It's a claim that this something was for the monks that wasn't for the people. That's why we don't believe it, that it, it was this originally here. Because nothing was for the monks and not for the people is the reality. In the end, he says, there were no secrets kept. I gave you everything you need, okay? Well then, Sariputta says, this is Anathapinda speaking. Let such talk on the Dhamma be given to the lay people clothed in white now for there are clansmen with little dust in their eyes who are wasting away through not hearing such a talk on the Dhamma. There will be those who will understand the Dhamma. And then after giving the householder Anathapindaka this advice, the venerable Sariputta and venerable Ananda rose from their seats and they departed. And soon after they had left, the householder Anathapindika died, and he reappeared in the Tusita heaven. And there, then when the night was well advanced, Anathapindika, now a young god of beautiful appearance, went to the Blessed One, illuminating the whole of Jetta's grove. And after homage to the Blessed One, he stood at one side and addressed the Blessed One in stanzas. O oh, Blessed One, in this Jetta's Grove, dwelt in by the sagely Sangha, wherein resides the King of the Dhamma, the fount of all my happiness, by action, knowledge, and Dhamma, by virtue and noble way of life, by these are mortals purified, not by lineage or wealth. And therefore, a wise person who sees what truly leads to his own good should investigate the Dhamma and purify himself with it. As Sariputta has reached the peak in virtue, peace, and wisdom's ways, and any bhikkhu who has gone beyond, at best, he can only equal him. And that is what the young god 
Anathapindika said, and the teacher approved. And the young god Anathapindika, thinking the teacher has approved of me, paid homage to the Blessed One. Keeping him on his right, he vanished at once. And when the night had ended, the Blessed One addressed the monks thus, monks last night, when the night was well advanced, there came to me a certain young god of beautiful appearance who illuminated the whole of Jetta's Grove. And after paying homage to me, he stood on one side and addressed me in stanzas thus, O oh, blessed one, is this blessed Jetta's Grove. Dwelt in by the sagely Sangha, wherein resides the king of the Dhamma, the fount of all my happiness, by action, knowledge, and Dhamma, by virtue and noble way of life, by these are mortals purified and not by lineage or wealth. Therefore, a wise person who sees what truly leads to his own good should investigate the Dhamma and purify himself with it. Sariputta has reached the peak in virtue, peace, and wisdom's ways, any monk who has gone beyond at best can only equal him. And that is what the young God said. And then the young God thinking, the teacher has approved of me. He paid homage to me and keeping me on his right, he vanished at once. When this was said, the venerable Ananda said to the blessed one, oh, surely venerable sir, that young God must have been Anathapindika. For the householder in Athapindika had perfect confidence in the venerable Sariputta. Good, good, Ananda. As far as reasoning goes, you have drawn the right conclusion. For that young god was in Athapindika. No one else. And that is what the Blessed One said. And the venerable Ananda was satisfied and delighted in the Blessed One's words. Sadhu, sadhu, sadhu. So these two suttas are really important. And the last one, I'm going to show you just part of it. I want you guys to read over this yourself. This is for your adventure. This is especially, it's not printed anymore. It's something Bonte saved. And maybe it was printed again, I'm sorry, in um, 2000 and 2006, may have been reprinted, but we had a very old copy and um, it was a bo from Bodhi Leaves, number 150 is where it comes from. Bodhi Leaves was a tiny uh, booklet before the uh, Dhamma Wheel, the Wheel publications. Bodhi Leaves came earlier, and this is where it came from. So it, this talks about life and death, and it talks about this uh, actually account that this monk completely preserved about his experience, what happened with this man who was dying. And in the one section right here, in the conclusion, I want you to, um, the conclusion that one can draw from the incident is that the last moment in the life of a person determines whether he will be reborn in a higher plane of existence or in a lower one. It is therefore the duty of all the well-wishers of the dying person to pacify his mind by reminding him of the good deeds he has done in his life <coughs> by reciting suttas and gathas. One should not cloud his mind by weeping, lamentation, or by drawing his mind to worldly affairs. So I'm going to talk about that just for a minute. I mean, how do I go out of here? I can't remember how I go out. Yeah, here I am. Okay. So the other piece of all of this is what are we supposed to be doing for the family when they have someone who is terminal and is going through this whole, um, this whole experience of someone in the family dying. And this is really, really important. We have all kinds of lessons all over the place to draw from. I'm gonna to try to briefly explain what we did in the case of Tom and Marie. Tom was a divorcee and his wife wasn't there anymore. And his daughter was 14 years old and they lived in Belgium and she was in high school. The critical point came when she was going to her prom. 
she was ready, getting ready for her prom, and then she fell down and fainted. They took her to the hospital and discovered there was a tumor in the back of her head, right? If you reach back here at the base of your skull, right there. And they determined this was inoperable and that she would die shortly from it. It was not possible to operate on it. And she would be conscious and communicable, but she didn't have to stay at the hospital. She could come home. He was devastated. This was his little girl, his only child, and 14 years old, and quite a beautiful thing. I wish I had a picture of Marie, but it was destroyed in a storm in Damasuka. I don't have it anymore. And she was very petite and very sweet and very beautiful. And her friends loved her. Everyone loved her at school. And here she was. She couldn't go to the prom, but that didn't. He, he was, his, what was tearing him apart in the whole thing he had to go through this about six or seven months before she died, you see. And nothing anybody could do. And his condition was worse than hers. And you know, when I worked in Texas in the children's hospital by the air base where my husband was stationed in officer training, I went and worked in the children's with the terminally ill children. And what you learned from working on that ward more than anything else was that the children could save their parents, but the parents couldn't save the children. The children were dying, but the children had a better grip on dying than the parents did. And they took their parents and helped them to get through what was happening. Kids are really strong. And we were working on last, you know, what do you really wish for that you can't have? And one boy, you know, they were so much fun to work with because one boy, he wanted really badly to go on a big canoe trip. So we got him one of the films and put up the film for him in his room so he could ride the canoe down the rapids and everything, Colorado River. Oh, it's fantastic. And he had such a great time. And we did several other things with them. And but these kids were just amazing. Tom was devastated. He broke down and had depression and was, couldn't sleep and had a rough time. And Marie knew he was having trouble. So when Tom came to me, he came for himself because he knew he couldn't help Marie was the idea in the beginning. And I was the first group, this is first group, a, a couple of people that I'm doing this with went to Bonte and said, what do we do? What do we do for Tom? We know how to maybe talk to Marie. She was very bright and everything, but she actually sounded okay on the phone. But Tom, what do we do with Tom? And he said, teach him what active compassion is. Teach him what active compassion is. Get him to do something. When you look at people dying and the family is around, everybody is already crying and already lamenting. The pe person is gone when my sister-in-law, she had liver cancer. Everybody, she wouldn't permit it. She, they came in the room if they were down. When they left, they were up. <laughs> she made them up, come up, you see. But the, 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 the problem here is, what can you do for the family? If the person is conscious, what we do is we tell you to go and get a scrapbook right away. And all of you can contribute. The whole family can gather together and bring in all of the pictures, all of the photographs, all of the memories, all of the awards, whatever it is, and make the life story while the person is still conscious. And then read it to them. Just like the kings had the chancellor read at the foot of the bed and read to the king why he was loved and what can we do for you as you're dying? What should you be thinking about when you're leaving? The good things that you did, the good memories, all the other stuff, just throw it away. <laughs> throw it away. And your tears and your sorrows and your lamentation and your pain and your grief and despair. I don't want it around me until I'm dead. 
Okay, when I'm dead, you can bring it around to me and you can do whatever you want. <laughs> but while I'm alive, I want to see your smile. And this is what Marie did. What Marie did was she invited her friends to come and she had her debt. Once he had the scrapbook, she said, I got a better idea. She had her friend go out and buy her dad a white cowboy hat. And he said, Marie bought me a cowboy hat. You know, the white cowboy is the good guy and the black cowboy, black, black hat is the bad guy, but the white hat is the good. He's my knight in shining armor with the white cowboy hat. He would come in the room and they would sit and he would finally say, what kind of music did you like? And she would play all the things that were her music and he would listen to them. And when it came around to the dance in the springtime, of course she wasn't at school anymore, but he got out the dress and dressed Marie and picked her up and walked around the room with her and danced. <laughs> danced with her. He danced with her. She was at her dance with her dad in a white hat, <laughs> in a white hat. And they laughed and they drank champagne and she had a great night. And it wasn't but a few weeks, I mean, uh, two or three weeks after that, she passed away. But you know what? Tom was okay. Now in my family, there's Irish and German. When somebody dies, both those groups, <laughs> they go and have a big dinner all around a big table. And we sort of have where we fry the person, you know, all the memories we had of this person, we bring them up and tell the stories and we share everything the person did and why did we love grandma and what did she do and what did she teach us? And we talk about the grand dam who was by the edge of the sea and what she taught us when she was 89 to 93 years old, standing there on the sand, digging up clams and eating them in front of us. <laughs> and she would tell us stories about how to guard ourselves in life. And I mean, this is another thing. She taught us these things before she um, got, she had a stroke later on, but she was, really rough on those people that took care of her at the nursing home because she came back from the stroke and learned how to race the wheelchair down towards the nurse's station. She would jerk it and get away from the guy pushing it and go down as fast as she could towards the nurse's station to turn the corner towards her room. And she's like 92 years old, you know, and the nurses are behind, behind the desk going, ah! You know, they're coming right at us, but we can't get out to stop her. And then she'd turn and go in her room and they'd scold her and say, you know, you let that voice, you let the voice put, oh, she had the most amazing stories. But when I was little, in her 80s, she would stand on the seashore beside the ocean and she would tell us the story that your life will be like an ocean. And I'm a little kid, and I'm only like this high next to her. And I'm saying, what do you mean? Life is like an ocean. It has tides. There's a low tide, and you can run around on the sand and play ball. There's a middle tide, and you can go out and play and ride the waves to the shore, body surfing. She taught us to body surf. Then there's the high tide. High tides are tricky. When you're older, there will be high tides in your life. You won't expect them. But when the high tide is there and you go in the water, it's this deep and you cannot touch the bottom and there are currents underneath. One of the things is you will be doing something in your life and just like the ocean, when the undercurrent pulls you, you go in the water here and it pulls you two miles down the beach and you have to come out of the water and walk back the beach to get to where we are. Don't take your eyes off the shoreline. Always watch the shoreline. Then she said, there are whirlpools in life as she ate another. 
another oyster. <laughs> These oyster clams, she's pulling them out and cracking them open and eating them at the, at the edge of the sea. And she said, there's whirlpools. Remember what I told you about the whirlpool? The whirlpool could be just like this virus. You didn't expect it. And the people who are working in the hospital must feel like it's just pulling them down. That's what you feel like when you get caught in a whirlpool. Don't you dare swim against the whirlpool. Take a deep breath. Allow it to pull you down to the bottom of the funnel. It will spit you out on the bottom and you swim up to the surface. Remember the whirlpool. And then she would say, there's another thing called a rogue wave and everything is going on just fine. You might be sailing out in the sea along the beach and you're just fine. And then a big wave comes up, oh, crashes over your boat, may flip the boat. But what do you do? You get under the boat and put your head up where there's air and hold on until you can flip the boat. Then you get in. You know how to get back in the boat. I taught you. You never, ever give up. But you don't go in the ocean until you know the rules in the sea. And then she said, you better look the other way because I was below her on the edge of the sea and she was above me up the beach a little when a big wave came and got me. <laughs> and she jumped in and pulled me out and took me to my parents and she, I was crying, I can still remember. And she said to my dad, make sure she knows she's not ever to turn her back on the waves. Don't turn your back on the waves. These are lessons, just lessons. This is what we talked about at the table. We talked about all the things. She went back so far, she was born in um, 1860. Seven, I think, or something crazy. She died um, in 1964, I think, or something like that. And she had unbelievable stories. They all have unbelievable stories. All your relatives have unbelievable stories that you don't know. Don't forget to say, I love you. Don't forget to kiss them when they go to bed. Don't forget to tell your parents that you care. Remember to shut up and listen to your parents tell you all the advice about how you should run your life. Remember, it's advice. I didn't say you had to do it, you know, but I said, bring them to dinner and let them know you're gonna listen to 60 or 70 years of experience and take it all in. Because what you cannot deny is that six or eight or ten brains is a lot more valuable than one. If you're smart and there's a big family involved, you'll take each one of them to the lunch somewhere and record it or get the information down record it somewhere, whether you write it down in front of them or you record it, and you keep it. But when you sit down and decide how to go on your track, on your path in life, you have a reference book of maybe six or seven people or more with lots more experience. It's like a research system, you know? Don't be silly about it. And when you write a plan, if somebody in the family leaves you the business and everybody's mad at you, when you finally decide to reorganize after the person is gone who was in charge. Then you take all these people, if you're smart, and pull one little thing out that they said very, very firmly to you. See if you can weave it into what you decide to do, and then let the family see what you decided. Because if they see one little tiny drop of what they said, 
99.9% of the time, they're going to think you're wonderful. And they're going to be so happy because you listened to them. Big problem today. Father is angry. Son gets angry too. Big reflection system going on right now. Lots of families. Daughter gets angry. Mother does the same thing back or vice versa. We're playing a mirror game here. Start watching the mirror and make a decision. I'm going to take hold of my destiny and I'm going to steer my own destiny. How? Change your mind and you get to change your life. And this is how we handle it with people dying. And after Tom and Marie, Tom was fine. He kept the hat. He finally gave away the dress. <laughs> he remembers it all. The heartbreak at the time it happened was, it was way back in 2002 or 2003. There was no money at all for me to fly to Belgium. And that's all she wanted was for me to fly to Belgium. They had no money to help me do it. We had no connections or supporters at all back then. But it was enough just to be able to say they danced and had champagne and she had her dress and she had her prom with the most important person in the whole world, her dad. Okay. So all of this is about being gentle and caring and loving kindness. It's active compassion. And what we're talking about today, we, our lesson before was Donna. And this is probably the ultimate Donna. And I couldn't find the right sutta, but then this fell in my lap when somebody called, actually two or three people called today. And how could I miss it? How could I miss it? So you, I used the Nathapindika uh, Sutta the first time in Sri Lanka with a good supporters. Her great aunt was dying of leukemia and was at the house when I was staying there. And she was 92 and never got married, never had any children, didn't become a nun. She stayed a lay person sweet and kind person you ever met, but was very weary about death, very kind of afraid. And we talked. And then Anathapindika's Sutta, I recorded it, not the front, and this is the thing, that Sutta is 17 minutes long. And if you take the front off and you take the back off and you just teach what Sariputta was teaching the person, it comes down to almost like 10 or 12 minutes, it's just 10 or 12 minutes. And so I recorded it. First, I read it to her each day for two or three days. And then she said, will you record it if you're leaving? And I said, I'll record it. And then um, her niece made, helped her to play it every night before she went to bed. And then she said to me on the phone, she's reciting it. I said, of course she is, because she liked it. And she started to re re recite it while she was listening to it. And then when she died, we don't know what she was doing, but she was smiling. She died with a smile. And that was the best part, to be 92 and die with that smile and not have any problems with anything anymore. She was a marvelous person. And then I went to a hospital in Kuala Lumpur and taught a woman who was dying in the hospital. I didn't know how that would go because she wasn't a Buddhist. So we kind of changed, just made it so we taught what it was and taught her what it meant and taught the person the past, the future and the present. And then we helped her to set it up so she could recite it, okay? And, um, she started to recite it. She had it written out. I gave it to her in the first person. I will train thus. I will. I will train. Instead of you should train, I will train thus. And then she practiced it until she died. So 
there are things that you can do for people you don't even know. The biggest one is that you can smile and give it away. That's the biggest one. So I want you all to be sure to read the last story that's in that collection, because Bonte made me put that in there, because <laughs> it's, it's something that we used to talk about when I first started training with him. And uh, he knew he had met the monk or something that originally put that together. And then this was reprinted later. So he knew the monk back in the 1980s, I think, or 19, 1980s or yeah, 1980s. So you have any questions, anybody pop it up. What would you like? <laughs> what can I do for you? Any questions? Mm -hmm. Okay. Mm -hmm. Um, Sister Kema, on the section 10 of um, the MN143, um, so, uh, Venerable, sorry for the sec, I will not cling to the consciousness element and my consciousness will not depend on the consciousness element. What does that mean? Can Sister Kema please explain? Yeah, just a second. Let me pull it up from the book. Wait, which section? Sex Consciousness. Sex no. Uh, oh. oh, wait a minute. Um, okay, the element, when you see the element, okay. The one thing that is happening for the person, when the person is dying, and you're dying is that you're you're conscious of what's happening your consciousness okay it consciousness is the pool of consciousness you which is or the mind door and the consciousness has like an urge. It wants to go through the sense doors. But to go through the sense doors, if you read, you need to read this and read this and read this. This is not something that you read one time. I mean, I read it to you, but I read this, I read this like probably 50 times the first time it was given to me to study before I could really get it. And to be conscious, the consciousness, perception, and feeling are conjoined. Do you know what that means? The consciousness, the perception, and the feeling are conjoined. This is from 43 or 44. I can never remember which one. I think it's Damadina, 44. So you play a game. If you don't understand that, you take a walk outside. And while you're walking, you contemplate. So let me write it down. It's like three circles, OK, like uh, a molecule. And you have perception feeling and consciousness. So it kind of looks like, it looks like this. You see the little, you see the little um, thing, see? All right, so you play a game in your mind. With me, I have to have the note because I can't even remember that far. But you say, can I feel something without being conscious and without perception? And the answer is no. Can I be conscious without any perceiving it and without feeling it? And the answer is no. And then you say, can I have perception of something if without being conscious and feeling it? So feeling perception and consciousness are conjoined. Okay, consciousness is important because what does consciousness do? Do you remember? From 44, what consciousness does? We says consciousness, consciousness, consciousness cognizes. So we need this word cognizing, okay? And if we go and we go to the, we go to the, uh, go to your thesaurus and look up cognize. I think I did that one in this little book. Let me see if I did it. To cognize is basically to understand, right? And you don't have any use for it anymore. 
when you when you get that far away with the diminishment of everything let it go let it go let it go you know somebody said to me can you demonstrate i love it when they do this to me women let me see cognize um i thought it was here but i might be wrong Cog no it's not going to be here it's not do it in a dictionary look up cognize and you're going to see it's to understand completely understand okay to is in and, and you don't have any need to understand everything in the world that's going on through all your sense doors if you're diminishing it and if you had um let's do it this way i'm not going to shoot it you know Okay, I'm on the whiteboard and I show you this way. And uh, I'm not gonna remember what all the sections were, but say the person is ill and they're there. And now we're gonna teach them this and we're gonna teach them to practice this line, okay? And they're going to diminish. And you're starting out, you play piano, okay? So you start out with a crescendo. Do you remember all the terms I was gonna call you and ask you earlier? <laughs> I can't remember anymore. You have the terms for how loud it is when you play the piano. So you have the crescendo and then it goes down, 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 doesn't it? And so this is what I mean. By the time you get to out of the sense doors and you've gotten rid of everything, you're diminishing. You're diminishing until you just run out. You see, that's what this is all about. And where this sits in the sutta to just the consciousness operation my consciousness um i will not cling to consciousness element the element itself is consciousness is part of the construct of the human being right so in the cut this is what i was going to show you the some of the things from the toolbox because really in the, the index of this course the way it was built before uh, we didn't really get there because we we started to define things up here but we didn't get to the bottom but some of the tools you have to work with is understanding you have five aggregates, right? This is the construct of the human being. And then you have um, six sense doors, right? And then you have three kinds of feeling. Okay, so if we look at the aggregates, we have um, body, feeling, perception, thoughts, or formations, and you have consciousness, right? So by the time you let go of the uh, sense door idea and the sense door object, which like the eye and the forms, and then uh, the sense door consciousness function, when you get way down here to this one, you're talking about in terms of the elements, you're letting all of that go too. Any of the knowledge that you have about the elements involved in the body, consciousness is one of the elements involved in the body is what they're saying do you get it so in terms of music it would be like hold your ears for a second <clears throat> somebody said to me what does what does this sutta do i said alive up there and he went all the way down until it disappeared the consciousness of even that the consciousness of vibration the consciousness of anything you get it do you get it um, it's a little, a little bit abstract but you see part of the problem in understanding this and this is what we're trying to work on in this class is that when we have all of these um get out of here again <laughs> Okay, what, what happens is um, when, um, how do I get back here? Oh, that's me, okay, how do I get rid of this? I don't know how to get back. I never can figure this out. Okay, 
Oop, okay. Part of the problem with Buddhism is when you try to look at one of the groups that exist in the Abhidhamma studies and stuff, and you try to say, I'm going to understand it by looking at the groups, or even this one, that one, this one, this one, this one. It can't be done. It doesn't work for you to get the deeper understanding. You see? You have to understand in terms of functionality. The people who are closest to understanding this are doctors, <laughs> medical people who have studied anatomy, physiology, and they can see the aggregates and they know the different systems of the body. See, So they talk about the eyes, I'm talking optical system, auditory system, olfactory system, oral system, physical body system, and the mental, mental system, see? But when we take one piece, all the job of consciousness is to cognize when the person is dying, the thing they're up against, the reason this is a good exercise is because you're teaching, let go, 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 let go. You see, that's what this is all about. It's like musical. If we took any instrument and tried to demonstrate it, I only have my voice. I can only do it with my voice, you know? But on the piano, you could write a whole, uh, a whole um, symphony about this. And you could have it in the end where it just faded away. I think somebody did that, some German, I can't remember. Or, I don't remember. It was at the music school, I saw that. <laughs> and this is, this is what I mean, okay? But consciousness is the cognition. And the last thing you're going to hold, want to hold on to is cognizing this. But if you have enough information, under, well, enough wisdom, enough, you have attained enough knowledge that has turned into wisdom of what life actually is, you see? Then you get this idea we're not talking about birth and life and then over here we're talking about death we're not talking about it that way he was not looking at it that way he was looking at it as life is the birth into it and the line and the death you see and then it becomes a cycle and you're caught with the energy how do you, how do you keep going around and around uh, that was really bothering me when I first started. <laughs> Where is this? Why is this wheel here? I would say, why didn't you make it a square or why didn't you make it with flat sides? <laughs> I used to bother a monks about this. <laughs> and um, it's because it moves, because it spins. Okay. It spins. So when we're learning this, um, I don't, I don't, this is not a good way to do it, but I can try. But when we're learning about this, um, we are learning how to, um, let's see if I have the right one, how to change this. So the first thing with the wheel of samsara, this is your dependent, this is your dependent origination, okay? And the wheel is spinning this way. It's Hello, Sister Gamma. I think she was disconnected. There, I'm back. Okay. 
Every, every time it blinks, it shuts me up. <laughs> okay. So this one is a little more complicated. This is like a transcendental dependent origination. That's what this piece is. Okay. But as, as you're practicing, it's like the, we're teaching you how to put a rope on the, on the, uh, the, the piece around the wheel, the, the um, rim of the wheel. And now you're going to try to start to break the wheel so it won't keep spinning. So the first thing you do is you stop reactions and see how it feels if you stop reactions, the birth of the reaction. And then when you keep practicing, you then start to stop, pull apart the wheel a little bit here where the habitual tendency is. The habitual tendency is your, habitual, your habit of reacting. Everybody has one somewhere in their life. So you decide, I'm just not going to go in there and pull one of these reactions out. I'm going to take a look at what happens if I stay in the present time and I don't, um, I don't, do the re don't do the reaction. So you keep practicing. And as I said, without showing you this uh, another way, I need to probably pull the pictures up maybe and show this to you one day. This is the way your practice is developing. And the more you pull, the wheel starts to break. It cracked over here. And then uh, all of a sudden, you let go of um, habitual tendency and you let go of clinging. You stop holding on to it when you're angry. You, and then you stop try to let go of craving sometimes. Now, we're not talking about total destruction of craving like the Aralite, but I'm trying to show you how the solution to the suffering was to break the wheel so that the, this piece, the clinging starts to fall out. And then the craving is the last one that pops out. When that pops out, uh, the wheel cannot carry the weight of the person. It's going to come apart. It's going to start to come apart. See, the rim is breaking and the wheel's not going to turn anymore. And when it finally breaks all together, the rim pops. The rim pops and stops. And there it is. It's all broken up. And there's a story that goes with this, like if you're trying to go through all four attainments, then it, they used to tell me, well, what's left of the air lot? Oh, this gets really interesting. I love this. You know, <laughs> one guy said, well, he disappears. <laughs> I said, well, the Buddha didn't disappear. He became an arahat and a Buddha. And then he taught for 45 years. How do you explain that? <laughs> because he didn't disappear. And then, then all those other 200 arahats that were teaching along with him, how, how did they do that if they disappeared when they were arahats? And he just went, I, I don't know. I don't know. I don't know. You see? Okay. And we have to say what was left of the arahat. Okay, so let's look at what's left of the Arahat. And we took the 12 links and we reduced the 12 links and crossed out the links that weren't there anymore. And then we realized that um, ignorance was gone and formations was here. Consciousness still happens. Mentality, materiality still is happening in the body. And the, the way we explain that is the material part of my ear and the mental process in my brain that helps my ear hear. The material part of my nose. <laughs> and what helps my nose uh, to operate, that is the mental part for each one of those, okay? And then... The six sense doors, they are still operating. Six sense doors are operating. Those monks could still see, hear, smell, taste, touch. Yeah, and they could uh, think, had brains too. And then they, they, their sense doors could make contact and feeling would still arise. But there was no reaction anymore. After feeling, there was no craving, no clinging, no habitual tendency. 
but there still was the birth of an action, but not a reaction. That was the birth of a response. So if someone fell down, would the Buddha help them up? Sure. If a monk fell down and cut himself, would you help them up? Sure. Were they supposed to take care of the other monks? Yeah. Yeah. See? And they had these wonderful descriptions of how they lived. I'll read some of them to you one time. Um, I can't grab it really fast here, but there was one I found that I just love. It goes through the whole entire day, every day of what they do and how life is. And it's amazing. <laughs> it's just amazing. And... Um, so this is where it gets interesting that they didn't disappear and they had great compassion and I think um, Major was talking, Major mentioned the Sutta Nipata and the Sutta Nipata has a lot of information in it about loving kindness, the Brahma Viharas. So we know that they were doing that. We know they were. I don't know what happened. I, okay, there I am again. Let's see. I don't know what's going on. <laughs> we never know. Can you hear me? No? Huh? Yeah, we yes. can hear you. Okay, okay. It's stuck. I don't know why it's stuck. So when the person is dying from the, from the untrained mind, they are caught in wanting to stay. And when the people in the room are not smiling and they're all miserable, then they really want to stay. And they want to embrace you and hug you and they want to save you even though they know they're going to die. So this is where some people get confused. One monk told me nobody should be around the person who's dying. They should be left alone. They were born alone into the world and they should leave alone. You should, because if you're there, they're going to want to come back and stay and come again. This is wrong thinking. This is wrong Dhamma. This is a Dhamma. That is not correct. Why is it not correct? Because we just talked about the story of what the Buddha wanted to have happen amongst the monks themselves and how to take care of each other and take care. But he also tells you there is no use in weeping before the person's gone. So that's why Bhante points out, I don't know where he found the instructions for that, but the celebration of the person, there are these stories about the celebrations of the kings as they're dying. And the chancellor all that wrote down everything each day in the, in the time the king was, the king, they're going to read everything that he did that was good as he's dying. So he can go away thinking uh, of positive things in his mind. And um, if, you're, if you're going anywhere, the last thought is that one that takes you there. So if you get upset and overly concerned about the people that are around you, if you're all Buddhists in the family, get together and explain this. There's going to be plenty of time for you to, to cry and to weep and to mourn after the person is gone. And, you know, uh, Tom and Marie's story is brilliant because when she brought her friends to visit her, she gave something to each one of them. Each one of them received something that she owned some little thing that they could keep and they were her friends and they really were grateful and they kept them. She was a very brave little girl and very sweet, very sweet. Anybody have any questions? Anybody have questions now? I don't know why this isn't active, but you say you can hear me, yeah? Yes, I have okay. a question, sister. Okay, go ahead. Yes. What what I have to do if I feel metta bhavana during the listening of Dhamma talk? What is it? I'm sorry, what do you what? Could you say it one more time? Uh, uh, during the Dhamma talk, I feel metta bhavana in yes. my center of heart. What can I do at that moment? 
feel metta bhavana in your heart, but give full ear and attention to the Dhamma talk. You can have the feeling and do that. And you keep yeah. smiling. People hear the Dhamma talk, it sometimes makes them very happy. And they're very smiling. And don't be afraid to sit there and smile as you're feeling it. This is not some, the problem, I think the confusion is, some people got really into modern times, got into meditation for the feeling of it. The feeling of it. They, they really wanted to get in for the feeling of it. But all the feelings are, are just like any other state of mind you'll ever experience is always going to not be there and it's going to arise and then it will be there and then it will pass away. That's true, isn't it? Huh? Yes. That, that's true. So you don't leave the Dhamma talk and start just feeling this great thing that's going on. You just allow it to be there without attention on it and pay attention to the Dhamma talk. And this is one of the reasons we don't, we tell people don't close your eyes at Dhamma talks. You keep your eyes open at Dhamma talks and pay attention. And especially to these silly monks and nuns who are using their hands when they talk that are Westerners and we, we do things with our hands that we want you to remember. Like when the, when the hindrance comes and it grabs onto you or feels like it's coming to you, grabbing onto you. And then you release and you relax and you smile and come back. Yeah. Okay. So we show, we show you things that we want you to see and understand, especially when Bhante pulls a little brain out of his hat and starts showing you parts of the brain. He doesn't want you going, oh, wow, that's really great meta. What a feeling. <laughs> he doesn't want you sitting there doing that. He wants you to pay attention, right? Okay. You are in control of where mind's attention goes. You all have to understand this. Nobody else can tell you what your intention is and where your mind should go. Only you can. Yes. The funny part about that part is that um, there once was a man who came to the Buddha and he wanted to learn meditation. And the Buddha said, why? And the man said, so I can regain control of my life. He was very serious. Men really are serious about that. As the head of the household, you want to have control of your life. I understand. And the Buddha smiled and paused a moment. And then he said, I will teach you, but you are not going to like this. And the man said, why? Because in order for you to get superior control of your life, when you are practicing, you must give up all control in order to see how all phenomena actually work. The truth about the phenomena. It is impersonal. It is impersonal. It is not me. It is not mine. It is not myself. I do not control it. And that's what you have to discover but when you leave and you're amongst a bunch of people who don't know that, you have superior control, don't you? Because you know the true nature of how everything works. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, you get it? Yeah. Okay. Good. So it's very powerful in that way. It is very, very powerful. I'm going to go like this for a minute. And um, I don't know how. Okay. Any other question? Thank you. Yeah, you're welcome. Any other question? Okay, we say uh, prayer. Uh, this next one on Wednesday that we're gonna do, we'll be, we're still working with tools, or what I call the toolkit. <laughs> uh, the preparatory things so you really understand them. So we're going into the sila, and we're going to look very deeply at the meaning of these precepts and what they affect in your life. So you can see how these, uh, the sila part, uh, what it has to do with the meditation. And um, there's only one reason why um, 
in modern times, we don't see more progress is because sila is not taken seriously as something that is not just for retreats, it's for all the time. And the moment you think that you can come to retreat and keep it and go without it at home, then it's not going to work. Your meditation doesn't help. But if you keep your sila all the time, remember what you're actually doing with this teaching. He was re-purifying and retraining the brain. That's what he was doing. Purifying and retraining of the brain. Okay? All right, we'll say our prayer. Okay. May suffering ones be suffering free and the fear struck fearless be. May the grieving shed all grief and may all beings find relief. May all beings share this merit that we have thus acquired for the acquisition of all kinds of happiness. May beings inhabiting space and earth, devas and nagas of mighty power share this merit of ours. May they long protect the Buddha's dispensation. Sadhu, 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 sadhu. Thank you.